listening to Flop Culture, a podcast where we talk about our favourite flops. Maybe it's a movie, an album, or quite simply, a moment in time. My name is Fanula Jones. Thank you for joining me for this episode, whether it's your first time or your umpteenth time. What a great word. Let's bring back umpteenth, not a flop. But before we get into this week's flop, let's take a look at the news because there's been a lot going on. This morning... I'm kind of reluctant to talk about this because, in my opinion, I think this is very much like tip of the iceberg in terms of the story, but it is the story that everyone's talking about. Uh, So I may as well give a rundown as to how we got here, but I am saying this like with a grain of salt, subject to change, etc, etc. So what is going on with This Morning and its hosts, Holly Willoughby and Philip Schofield? They've worked on air together for years, became great friends as a result, but now the friendship seems to have absolutely fallen apart and people are glued to the show to see signs of pressure and tension and everything like that. They've kind of been plagued with these rumours the last little while. I think some were suggesting that it was stemming from the queue skipping controversy they got into last year at the Queen's funeral. But if you're to believe other reports, it might even go back further than that. So in 2019, apparently Phil was very annoyed that uh, Holly got the I'm a celeb, get me out of here job. Uh, ended up covering Frank and Partland when he was off and they went up after for it. Apparently he was very rashly about that. Didn't want her to mention uh, the I'm a celeb victory on this morning. And there was also a photo spread done at the time in a weekend newspaper that focused on her and not him. Apparently he was right about that as well. Tensions rose further then, allegedly, when Holly asked Philip to stop posting videos of her drinking on social media, but didn't ask him directly. Apparently used their joint management company to ask him that. Um, And then I suppose QGate happened. Then we've seen them take time off air for various reasons. Recently, Holly was supposedly suffering with shingles. Philip took some time off uh, when his brother was facing charges for child sex abuse crimes, uh, in which he was subsequently convicted for. Fans seemingly have noticed that she's like rinsed her social media of him as well. There's no reference to him in any of her bios when there was previously, specifically her Twitter bio. And I think she's removed some photos from him on her Instagram. And you know when that happens, it's a death knell, whether it's a relationship or a friendship. Uh, And then there'd been a report last week in The Mirror in the UK that Holly had basically gone to ITV and was asking them to make a decision over uh, Philip Schofield's future on the show because she wants to like rebrand herself and plan for the future if necessary. All of these rumours are swirling, but then Philip comes out with a statement of his own that he didn't run by Holly, which said this. The last few weeks haven't been easy for either of us. My family went through a real ordeal and Holly's support throughout meant the world to me. As to the support of my bosses at ITV, my editor, Martin Frizzell, and the whole This Morning family, including our amazing viewers. And he explained that Holly had been his pal through thick and thin, kind of the only real acknowledgement of the elephant in the room, what everyone was talking about. She didn't know about this apparently and was blindsided, deeply upset, or the quotes we're seeing in the media um and other sources saying that it was like very desperate out of philip to do this when like nothing has been said and nothing has been said since they've been hosting on this morning as normal you've all the body language experts watching pr experts watching what's gonna happen amen holmes who obviously used to present the friday shows on this morning he's on gb news now and he's come out and said that the show is an institution it'll go on without them and kind of made some other like jabs at them haven't really seen anything else since seems to be a lot of rumours that they might move towards like an all-female presenting team perhaps Alison Hammond's obviously really popular on there Josie Gibson also really popular Alison and Holly actually ended up co-presenting together when Philip was off during that time so yeah what do we think is going to happen who's going to stay who's going to go are they both going to go who's going to replace them Let me know at flopculture underscore pod and helloflopculture at gmail.com if you have thoughts and theories. Elsewhere, uh, Keith Urban, unwittingly hard launching couples, is my new favourite thing. Ozzy, Australian country music artist, married to Nicole Kidman. He was recently attending the Eras tour, Taylor Swift's tour, and was delighted to be there. Shared a TikTok of himself and Nicole dancing to style. He has great taste. Um, But in the background of the video... 
unwittingly, uh, <laughs> you could see Phoebe Bridgers and Bo Burnham getting off with each other. Phoebe Bridgers obviously opening occasionally for Taylor Swift on this tour, a musician in her own right, recently split with Paul Mescal uh, last December. Uh, apparently were engaged at that time. That wasn't fully confirmed, but that seems to be the general consensus. Bo Burnham, comedian, actor, musician in his own right, I suppose. This had been long, 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 long rumoured, pretty much. And I think fans were kind of maybe in denial, maybe allowing people their privacy. Um, But... I don't know, the proof is in the smooching. they very cosy, so we'll see. Bo was obviously most recently with Lorene Scafari, I think her name is, and she directed the Living Plus episode of Succession and was also part of the team behind one of the greatest movies of all time, Certified Bop, Hustlers. But there's no word on what happened with their relationship, so who knows? Congrats to them. Congrats to Keith for being messy. I'm all for celebrities being messy in a way that doesn't like objectively harm anyone. Like, this is funny. I hope he didn't get in trouble. I hope Taylor didn't text him after and was like, mad or Nicole. But anyway, we'll see. Finally, could we see the original cast of Gossip Girl reuniting for a new series of the show? The show's official Twitter account shared a cryptic tweet uh, sending fans into a frenzy and it came with a photo featuring the six main cast members, Blake Lively, Leighton Meester, Taylor Momsen, Ed Westwick, Penn Badgley and Chase Crawford. I can't even begin to explain how much they all sound like fake names still all these years later. I don't think it's a new show or a new series of this show, rather. They're obviously just off the back of the reboot, which only ran for two seasons and didn't really kind of do the things that they wanted it to do. Um, There could be an argument that there's still an audience there because they did that reboot, so like, why wouldn't they do it? I just don't think anyone any member of this cast is up for doing this at this point. I could be totally wrong, but that would be my vibe. And also, it's the 15th anniversary this year of it coming out. So I'm wondering if it's something more to do with that and not necessarily like a full-scale return, but maybe like an anniversary reunion kind of vibe thing. I don't know. We'll see, or maybe we won't. And that's the beauty of life, isn't it? Let's talk flops, shall we? Absurdist, hilarious, deliciously dark. Just some of the adjectives used to describe the movie Drop Dead Gorgeous. A satirical, mockumentary, black comedy about a small town beauty pageant. Criticised upon its release for its lack of subtlety, it's actually that in-your-face humour that's seen the movie gain a cult following since its 1999 release, in which it actually lost money at the box office. And while there are certainly crass moments that wouldn't exactly hold up in today's culture, fans of the film will defend it breathlessly. To look into exactly why that is, I'm joined by TV critic and teacher James Dempsey. James, lovely to have you on Flop Culture. How are you doing? Thank you. Um, I'm good. Uh, I'm tired perennially, but um, living. I love that. I love the honesty. No one is ever that honest when they come in. They're like, I'm great. Happy to be here. We're all depressed. It's fine. We're all depressed. We're all exhausted because it's life. Um, this thing that you've picked is like the quintessential flop. And I'm kind of annoyed at myself that it that I haven't watched it before now because it just so imperfectly encapsulates flop culture and everything yeah. it's about. So what did you pick? I picked the seminal 1999 mockumentary Drop Dead Gorgeous. Did you watch it when it came out? Yeah, not in cinemas, right? Okay. Like, I, I knew you were going to ask me, right? I obviously knew you were going to be like, when, you know, when did you first encounter this? Oh, I'm, am I that predictable? <laughs> am I that predictable, James? Right? And I was like, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't really remember. Like, I, I want to have a vague... Uh, like, I would love to have this amazing anecdote of like, oh, we went to Extra Vision every week and like rented it. And that is just definitely not the truth. Okay. I honestly think I probably first saw it in my next door neighbor's house during the summer because they had lots of things on VHS, uh, including like um, like teen shows, right? Mm. And I would imagine I was in Catherine Bulger's house and she... Uh, Sorry, Catherine Bulger. She, she, yeah. Iconic, iconic trim <laughs> uh, legend, right? Uh, and she, um, I, I feel like she showed me it in between us playing like Super Smash Brothers on the Nintendo 64. Incredible. That's, yeah. that's a good enough story for me. I'll take that. <laughs> I love that. Absolutely. Uh, what's it about for anyone who is unfamiliar? Okay. So it's about 
Uh, so it is a mockumentary, mm. right? Um, although the production values on this uh, team of, of uh, filming the mockumentary are pretty high. Um, so it's set in the fictional Minnesotan town of Mount Rose, all right? The writer, Lona Williams, is actually from the Minnesotan town of Rosemount. <laughs> so she, <laughs> she knows her stuff, right? I wonder where she got that from. Yeah, right? And... Um, so there's this beauty company called Sarah Rose Cosmetics and they run this like beauty contest and it's the Miss American Teen I think and I was reading about like I did I did my homework before coming right because I didn't have a good anecdote so I was like I better have some content better and, just do the research right? and um, the writer Lona Williams she herself was a beauty queen as a like as a Teen. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, she's she, uh, none of this happened in her real life, but like she she uh, put all to, put together all of the ideas while writing this, and this was her first ever script, and it was a total flop. And I know I'm going getting off topic, and I will come back to it in a second. But she also wrote Sugar and Spice. I was just about to say if you, you the name was familiar, she wrote Sugar and Spice, which we covered this season as yes. well, but she covered it under a pseudonym because yes. the script had changed so much yeah, from when she first she wrote it. it. She was like, I don't want to be associated yeah. with it. So. So she's the queen of the flops. Queen of the right? flops. You need to get her on the, this couch, right? I wonder, would she? She did a pretty extensive <laughs> right? interview at BuzzFeed about saw, yeah. uh, Drop Dead Gorgeous. So, so anyway, so in joke. this Minnesotan town, they follow, um, like there's, so Kirstie Alley uh, is um, Gladys Lehman, who is kind of running the whole show, right? So she's the the local chapter of, the, of this beauty competition, right? She's running the show there. And her daughter, Becky, uh, is... The, like you know, cl- typical all American. How 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 cursy can I get here? Mm. Very cursy. All right, she's a bit of a bitch, right? Like <laughs> right, and basically, <laughs> she's all American bitch, right? <laughs> and um, then into the fray comes Kirsten Dunst as um, Amber. Amber Atkins, Amber right? Atkins. And she's like, uh, quote unquote, trailer trash, all right? Living in, in, in the caravan park. Yeah, like kind of weird, like yes. has a, has a after school job, like putting makeup morgue. on corpses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? and like her talent is like tap dancing. Yes. So like, yeah. And then additionally, you also have Brittany Murphy, as uh, like in this iconic scene, Peter's gay, right? <laughs> even though it's really weird. Like it just comes out of nowhere. But anyway, right? If, if like people know that scene, yeah. you have Amy Adams in her first ever uh, sh- starring role. I mean, it's a relatively small role, but she's she, looks, she is she's dynamite though. She like is. it's you know when you it's only when you see someone here, it's like you have it like yes. and you had it from this moment. Like it's and you have uh, Alison Janney as Loretta, who is Kirsten Dunst's mother. Uh, Ellen Barkin's like best friend mm. and it is so it follows them throughout the the run of you know the lead up to the beauty pageant the pageant itself and then kind of immediately after and this tripart structure each little part of it is so entertaining in its own right right so okay first of all you have the competition and you you meet all these aspirant beauty queens and they all have a story they have a talent etc they're all fully realized. Like they're, I think they're so well realized characters mm. because you immediately understand who they are, why they're taking part, right? So Becky, the aforementioned wagon, she, she, she's as she says, God loves winners, right? So she's just in it to win for the glory for the crown, and her mother is obviously, you know, running the show and pulling strings behind the scenes in order to mean that she is definitely going to win no matter what. And then you have uh, Amber and she, as I said, you know, she's like, the beauty pageant is the route out of the town for her, right? And that comes from Lona Williams herself, right? She saw beauty pageants as her way of getting out of Mount Rose, if that's, I can't remember which one is the right one anyway. But she, I think she, I read she came second in some like national beauty competition and got some sort of scholarship and with that went to the University of Minnesota and all the way to Hollywood where both of her movies were flying. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But she did it, you know, she still did it. She did it. it and that's what matters. Yes. And uh, this film is 24 years old this year. You can be guaranteed that next year when content farms need something to talk about and it is celebrating its 25th anniversary, it is going to go through a revival and a rehashing and a reviewing and all this because it's really funny. It's really funny. Like, I watched it definitely during the pandemic because uh, it was probably 20 years old at that point, right? Mm. Or early in the pandemic anyway. And I hadn't seen it in years and years and years. And I just thought it held up so well. Now, there are parts of it that are 
inexcusable, mm. right? Like, so it, it's set in 1995, it's made in 1999. Uh, there are a lot of jokes at the expense of eating disorders that I don't think they would make now. No. Right? Uh, there are a lot of jokes at, uh, you know, about... Um, uh, you know, people with developmental issues mm-hmm. that I don't think they would make now? No, I don't think so. No. But as a fresh viewer, first timer, what did you think? I also thought it was very funny. Okay. I think there's just, there's a couple of lines that, so obviously it gets to, there's one particular one, they're coming to the end of that main pageant and they won't let uh, Amber perform because her costume has conveniently been stolen. Yeah. So uh, Brittany Murphy's character is like, take my costume because it's been pre-approved because yeah. that was the whole thing. They won't let her perform because she doesn't have an approved costume. So she pulls out of it and Amber's allowed to perform. But when Brittany starts undressing, uh, Amy Adams' character is like, no, they won't let you perform <laughs> naked. I asked. <laughs> and it's just, it's so quick, but yeah. it's just, it's, and I agree, obviously some of it is in like such bad taste, but at the same time, it's like, it's so absurdist that it's like, you can't really be like, you know what I mean? Like it's... I think what works, I think why it works is, um, even though it is absurd, it feels somewhat realistic, right? As in like, the performances are all quite natural, despite the absurdity that's mm. taking place. It's actually, I, I, I think it's because it's a mockumentary, right? If this had been a straightforward comedy, just, you know, with the fourth wall between us and the viewers, or us and the characters, I don't think it would have worked as well following that plot, because it would have been really, like, silly, right? But the point is, you see Kirsten Dunst I think she was only 17 at the time, right? You see her talking to you because she's talking straight to the camera and you're and you're the viewer. So she's talking straight to you. And that creates this, like, or it breaks down, it it, it, it invites you in to, like, be a, a participant to the absurdity that is taking place, right? And, like, because of that naturalism, like, look, I'm I'm talking absolute shite here, sorry, because there is a bit where, <laughs> like, there's a bit where a, a, a beer can gets fused to someone's hand and <laughs> And I'm going, cinema verite, right? right? I know, but I think the point is, is that you all believe that they're doing it for whatever yes. reasons. You know what I mean? Like there is a realism in that. Yes. And it's, you know what I mean? And like everyone knows the, even if you're not going to apply it to pageantry or whatever, everyone knows that like pushy stage parents exactly. that yes. Kirstie Alley is. And uh, like, the, you know, the high school cheerleader, Denise Richards character yes. who can do no wrong. Like, like don't get me wrong, obviously it's nuts with the explosion at the yes. end, like the police standoff at the very end. Yeah. But and you I, do I, believe they all want to and they all have their own motivations yes. for it. And I failed to also mention in my description of the plot that there is, you know, the, it's a pun, obviously. It's not just drop dead gorgeous because they're beautiful. It's drop dead, comma, gorgeous, as in I'm going to kill you. Because uh, Kirstie Alley then starts, well, I mean, spoiler for a movie that's 24 years old. Uh, she starts orchestrating the untimely demise of various participants who are all supposed to be Amber, right? It's Amber that she's going after because she's the number one competition for Becky, her daughter. So she keeps trying to offer in different ways. So it, 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 There's this brilliant scene right at the beginning where they introduce, you know, they're introducing all of the queens. And one of them is this real tomboy uh, who, like, who is the president of the gun club and Becky is only the vice president. And she's, uh, she wins everything. She's a winner, this girl. And you then see her riding, like, is it a lawnmower or something, like, over oh, the I crest it was of the a hill? A tractor, maybe, something, right? Something, anyway. And she rides over the crest of the hill and then it just explodes, <laughs> right? And basically, we, are, we ultimately find out that she has been killed because she is, she's a winner. Mm. And Becky wants, uh, or, well, Gladys wants Becky to win and Becky is going to win no matter what. So then various other things start happening throughout the, the rehearsals, like a, a, a light falls off the stage and hits one of the participants in the that head. That was so funny, I I quite enjoyed uh, that. That was supposed to kill Amber, but she, through all these, through her niceness, right, it's all, it, what saves Amber is she's nice, right? And like, it's hard to sell nice, right? It's hard, it's, you know, in, in a, in a, in a mockumentary that is about grotesquerie, right? Like these grotesque characters with evil motivations and, you know, selfish uh, morals and uh, questionable ethics and all this, right? Amber is nice and that Kirsten Dunst can sell that all-American niceness mm. is incredible, right? Yeah. And like, you you are rooting for her, right? Like, I mean, I've seen, like, you know, I was watching the movie today for probably, I don't know, 15th, 16th time 
And like, okay, I hadn't seen it in a few years, but like, I'm sitting there going like, Amber, <laughs> they won't let you dance, <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> and like, she does this tap dancing and uh, I mean, it's not even that, it's a grand. Yeah, like, it's, it's fine. It's yeah, grand, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but like, it is just really uh, so well conceived and, and paced. And I, 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 did you read any of the reviews? Because they are brutal. Yeah, I have one here from Dennis Harvey for Variety. He called the film a fitfully amusing satire that would have gained a lot of mileage from just a tad more subtlety. Actually, that's not even one of the worst ones. But yeah, yeah I think it only has like 46% on yeah. Rotten Tomatoes. Like people were not kind about this when it no, came out. They were not kind at all. And, and like... I, part of me thinks it's because for well, part of me thinks because this is like a fluffy teen comedy, mm-hmm. right? But it isn't at all. Like, it, okay, it's just that the subjects happen to be all of these, you know, teenage girls, right? Yeah. But like the rest of it is Machiavellian scheming, right, mm. to off the competition. You have. <laughs> <laughs> like this subplot involving the three judges, one of whom is Lona Williams, the writer, mm. right? So the blonde, you know, the blonde Jean, I think is her yeah, name. Yeah, she, she wanted a bigger speaking role in it and the director was like, no, because we'd have to pay for it. I mean, her and the director didn't get on <laughs> and what is his name? Michael Patrick Jan. Yeah. Um, I think he she wants to be one of the actual contestants in the pageant. Right. Uh, but again, he was like, I don't want you to have a speaking role. So that's why she does not speak well, in the movie. She, so. she obviously was pissed off because she looks really miserable. Yeah, she, <laughs> she says it in her face. Yeah. And um, uh, so basically, right, the three judges are are just put there in order to make sure that Becky wins, right? Because they are completely useless. They've never done it before. But one of them, is, his name is John Doe, right? <laughs> D-O-U-G-H. <laughs> I think he's the pharmacist, I think. Right? Yeah. Because you see him in a white coat maybe at the very beginning, right? And he is, he, he's just a creep. Yeah. I mean, that's his character. He's just a creep looking at the girls. And, but he's so funny. And ha- like, I mean, it's terrible, right? It's As I said, it is grotesque. But he's like, he, you know, the the camera crew are filming him and he's digging himself into a hole by his, like, he, by his, of his own creation. Like, he'll start saying these random things. And then realize what he's saying. It, it, like mostly, what he's saying is actually not that bad. And then, because of his fear of being caught out as the creep that he is, he then just goes further into it. And like his reaction, you know, there's <laughs> there's a bit where he's watching them rehearse uh, their dancing, and then suddenly he's got like a camera <laughs> right in his <laughs> like a like a you know a, like a camcorder yeah. uh, in his in his and he's oh this oh just for accidents on the road <laughs> right like it's just really silly and funny and it just yeah like um when i think about these terrible reviews i got i think it it's just it was dismissed as this silly girl comedy right and and in the 24 years since then not only has it's has it rid, risen in many many people's estimation, mm. but like look at the cast, like look at what they have gone on to do in twenty four years, mm. right? They are some of the biggest stars in Hollywood now. Uh, like Alison Janney uh, has incredible in this, like has, just so good. Uh, and the thing is, she's playing like the nice version of the person she won an Oscar for. Right? I was going to say. Yeah, it's like right? incredibly similar. Like, it, it, like that character could be in Itania, right? Yeah. That kind of like trailer trash, you know, uh, down on the, her look, uh, f- like fighter eking it out, yeah. right? But um, so her Loretta uh, is like has the best, she runs away with the best one liners in the show, right? Mm-hmm. There's this bit uh, at the very end. So at the very end after, uh, so Becky wins and then as you said, explodes <laughs> on a giant <laughs> swan. And the, my favorite bit is when the priest at her funeral is like, and that's the reminder of why we should buy American, right? Like, it's just really, really funny, right? So Becky wins the competition in a fix and then gets blown up in, when her pageant float explodes. Yeah. And because of that, Amber becomes, you know, the new reigning queen because she was in second place. And then she goes off to nationals and she, or to state and she wins state because um, of a like salmonella outbreak amongst uh, seafood platters, right? Sick, yeah. in, a, in a really odd scene that involves a lot of throwing up that, you know... Yeah. Uh, it, it, if you have that phobia vomit, I yeah. would get the timestamps for that scene because yeah. it's a lot. But if you do skip that scene, you will miss one tiny throwaway joke with Alison Janney in it, right? So Alison 
Danny has followed her to nationals uh, or to the states. Because the mom can't go yeah. because she's in hospital because there was a fire and she's recovering from having this beer can fused yeah. to her arm. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean. It's it's what like a sentence, right, what a right. sentence. <laughs> but it's some and and uh, Ellen Barkin is really funny in this role as well as the mother, right as well, right. But anyway, so then, um, so Alice and Johnny ha, ha, is at the bar in this hotel, and she starts flirting with the barman, and when all the girls are throwing up because of the salmonella. Uh, she appears outside of a door with the barman, where we, yeah, and the what they're alluding to is that they have been, you know, having a romantic time together. <laughs> and Alice and Johnny comes out the door, and she's like, "Could they hear us or something?" Like, because they're all throwing up, and it's just this tiny little throwaway joke, and it's so funny. Oh, so good! <laughs> I just love those little moments. It's very good. I think you're right in the it being perceived as like a teeny girls movie because yeah. it was the same with Sugar and Spice. But I'm also wondering, was it because you had this other like glut of teen movies at the time and it was just, I don't know, lost amongst the mix and because it was so absurdist in comparison to like your 10 Things I Hate About You yeah. or something like that. Yes, I, I think also part of it is, right, so Sigourney Weaver was originally uh, uh, like supposed to play the Kirstie Alley role, mm. right? And like this, which I kind of love to see, even though Kirstie Alley is like very good in that. I have to say, but I think this is the role Kirstie Alley was born to play. Yeah, right. Because like Sigourney Weaver, uh, yeah. Look, would I? I'm sure I would have loved it either way, right? Mm. But like, you got to go with the performance that you get. Yeah. And Kirstie Alley is so perfect in this because in the first kind of like ten minutes when they're establishing who she is and her like. The kind of the her her vice like grip over the little bit of power that she has in this town, right? Uh, now the least believable thing is she's only supposed to be thirty four. <laughs> right? It's because like there is a bit on this on, where she's on stage and she's like, seventeen years ago I won this, and I'm like, you were 17, 17 years ago. Okay, right? mm, okay, babe. Okay, right. Honorable anyway. Wilson there, yeah, but it's okay. Right, right, but whatever, right? <laughs> um, but when you know, so Kirstie Alley, like, obviously, I mean. In the years since this, she uh, obviously. So when did she die? She died in January, maybe. I think. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. So, but like R.I.P. and all that jazz. R.I.P. Right. But in the last ten years of her life, not a great person. No. Right. So, what's been really interesting watching this is kind of seeing like the parallels between what we know of her now mm. and the character that she's playing, but. Prior to this, like, you know, how old were you? You were, you were you're young. In 1999, yeah. I was four. Okay. Right, so, like, what, your awareness of Kirstie Alley's 90s output? Look who's talking. And cr like, that's, what a movie. Oh, my God. What a, what a trilogy. And when the animals start talking in the last, don't get me started on Look Who's Talking. We'll be here all day. <laughs> Fucking hell. So she basically was like, um, what was she? She was like a sitcom star in the 80s. Right? She, I think her first, her first everything is in a Star Trek movie and then she's in Cheers. She replaces like the main female lead on that really successfully. Then in the 90s, she had a number of like sitcoms called, like one called Veronica's Closet, which is like a, a riff on, uh, what's that famous lingerie brand? Victoria's Secret. Victoria's right? Secret, oh yeah. Right? And basically... Um, but her star even, I think, was in The Decline by, like, 1999. And if someone, like, hear me out. If in 2023, a movie like this was made, right? Obviously, the really, really um, uh, line, uh, line towing jokes wouldn't get made, right? Yeah. But you, I, I'm telling you, you could see someone, like, a, you know, a character actress playing that role and being like lauded as an awards contender, right? Because she's so in that role. Like her, her Gladys has these brilliant jokes that she thinks are so funny and are not. Like the, <laughs> there's a bit where she's on the stage during the ceremony and it's about, is that applause for me or my dress? Right? <laughs> and it's just like, it's so false and fake and practiced and, uh, and it, it's like a polished performance that I just think now would be like, praised everywhere. Yeah. But Kirstie Alley is not a big enough star to carry the movie, right? Like, I mean, the rest of the actresses in it are obviously all, uh, have uh, eclipsed her in terms of star power, right? Because you, you can see it there on the, you know, they're all brilliant, yeah. right? But like, I don't think she was a big enough name to get people to look at the show back, or at the movie back then. 
And now, well, it's not going to happen now either, right? But the whole thing is, why didn't people like it? I don't know. I think it's slightly sexist, undoubtedly, mm. right? Because it's about a show about, uh, it's a it's a girls movie about girls, right? <laughs> right? Boo, right? <laughs> uh, secondly, By the girls, for the girls, am I right? right? <laughs> it's, um... It's pre-girl boss, right? So like, yeah. you know, right? So who cares, right? So the, And then secondly, it's younger women. It's, about, it's, it's seen as a teen movie, even though I really don't think it is. I don't think it is either. Right? And then thirdly, it is like uh, a comedy about women and that's a harder sell as well. Mm. But honestly, the whole thing is, I think, 97 minutes of... A perfect length a as well, perfect I perfect length. The jokes... That are uh, the jokes that are shocking are are bad, right? But the ones that land land perfectly, mm. and it is just a lovely, like it's like a perfect cult movie, mm. right? Because and I, I, you know, I was reading actually in my research that um, it, uh, so Gia Tolentino writes for the New Yorker. She wrote this appraisal of it when it started streaming uh, recently, right? Because I I bought it. I, I just I bought it on YouTube. Because that's the only place you could... So did I. Wink. <laughs> right? Wink. Someone get it on streaming over here, please. Like, it's very irritating. Well, so the first thing I did when I knew I was going to be doing this was like, I, I searched, I always, and this is like terrible uh, for as an Irish person to say, but like I searched, uh, get over it streaming UK. Mm. Right? Because usually if it's streaming in the UK, you can, it'll stream here and you'll just you'll be able to find it faster, right? Mm. Um, but no, can't get it nowhere, it's streaming nowhere, right? It began streaming in the US only, I think, like two years ago. Yeah. Right? And prior to that, its DVD run had like, you know, the had sold out or whatever. Like they weren't reprinting I don't know if that's the verb you do for DVDs. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> Whatever they do for DVDs. Yeah, they weren't producing yeah. uh, more DVDs of it. And like uh, at one point, one was selling on Amazon for $60. I saw that, yeah. Not right? like. So this is a movie that uh, cost somewhere between 10 and $15 million to make. It made roughly $10 million at the box office. It was a critical panning, a box office failure. And... Uh, unavailable, like unavailable, unavailable to stream legally and to buy practically legally as well, right? So, how has it managed to garner this audience through word of mouth and cult viewing? Mm. And that's what I'm doing here as well, proselytizing it as well. I love that spreading the good word. <laughs> uh, Kirsty Alley seems to have been a bit of a, a menace on set as well. I don't know if you read any of this. So, like, <laughs> uh, your one who wrote it, Williams, was talking about how, like, she was kind of the biggest star on set, I suppose, at that time, because like Kirsten Dunst, obviously we know what she went on to be and she was very much on the rise, but was obviously still so fresh. But like, she refused to wear a lot of the costumes that were chosen for her. She didn't show up to fittings. So she had them all sent to the Scientology Celebrity Centre, would try them on there, refused to work with a dialect coach because obviously they're doing like, you know, what they're doing like that Minnesota accent, which I'm not going to attempt to do, but it's very funny. And it's like, it's funny because the accents are like hammier than they're supposed to be anyway. Definitely. So it's like, whatever. Uh, yeah, so William said, this was in the uh, BuzzFeed article that I mentioned and I'll link below. She gets up there and she announces that she's just quit smoking, she's on a diet and she's got her period and she's not fucking kidding. <laughs> 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 like a menace, like. Yeah, love it. Uh, her, her career is kind of interesting and like... Uh, look, I'm not some Kirstie Alley apologist. <laughs> I'm, 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 like, I'm not going to try and defend any of her very contro- controversial positions over the last 10 years. Yeah. But, um, but, but this performance is spectacular. Like mm. she is fully realised as Gladys. You believe that she is this conniving, uh, simpering, smiling witch, right? Who is ready to literally kill you in order for her daughter to win a local beauty pageant. Like, and that's it. Um, Some of the side gags are really funny. Like there's a bit where they're doing their talent and uh, this is the, um, you know, where where Becky comes out to do her talent and she starts singing Ricky Valley's um, You're Just Too Good To Be True to then have a Jesus on a cross wheeled out and, (laughs) (laughs) and like sing to Jesus and take his hands off the cross and wrap them around her. And then with a, a brilliant flourish right at the end of it, she she carries the cross off the stage <laughs> like her bent over. It's 
really, 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 really funny. Uh, there's um, at the, <laughs> there's a bit at the beginning where they're trying to pick a theme for the for the um, for the pr- <laughs> this is for so the good, pageant, yeah. and uh, and Gladys is sort of going, mm, I've got it. Proud to be an American. And then it's like, what was last year's one? America, A OK. <laughs> and the year before, by America. Like it was all just America, America, America. So it it really uh, like well encapsulates this, you know, American exceptionalism of the late 90s, right? America, the best, everything is perfect, small town life is happy. But the undercurrent of it is, despite you know, the beauty pad despite it being a beauty pageant, right? Everything looks pristine and perfect. The undercurrent is people will blow you up, people will shoot you, people will uh, drop lights on your head if that is a way for them to get a foothold to success. Mm. And if that's not the American dream, I don't know what is. Am I right? <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> uh, speaking of patchy careers, Denise Richards in this, also very good. Yeah, definitely her best role uh, by a mile. Like, so good. Yeah. Just quintessential Becky. When you were talking about that performance there, it reminded me of when they're doing the judges' interviews and they ask, like, if you were a tree, what would you be? And Amy Adams' character, who is, like, not being funny, kind of positioned as, like, like Dumbo. this, like, yeah. yeah, but, like, the slaggy gal in yeah. inverted commas, but is also kind of, like, anti, like, it's never, it's not a thing of her character. Nobody's judging her for being, like, this yeah. raunchy teen girl, whatever. So she answers that she'd be a green tree, which is iconic. <laughs> but Denise Richards, uh, Becky, is talking about, like, and I'd have a strong Christian trunk. Like, it's just, she is just so, every answer yeah. is just so it's, clearly defined, bringing it back to Christianity, community, yeah. being American. It's just... They go to her, you know, who would you pick to be the next president? And she's like, my mom. Because <laughs> her blue ribbon, uh, her blue ribbon raspberry pie, or rhubarb pie could solve world, world hunger. And um, her, like, something about salt, bringing world peace. Uh, like, it's just really, really <laughs> funny and then because they're trying to stitch up Amber right so you're we're seeing all of the other queens you know uh, taking part in this thing and it's all these generic questions right and then they turn to Amber and they turn the sheet and they go to her spell all of the states in alphabetical order right and she's like what so and then but it's but but it's like a perfect little scene encapsulating her as a trier as well, right? Because she starts and goes Alabama, A-L-A, B-A-M-A, and then like Arizona, whatever's next, right? And then it goes three and a half minutes later. West West Virginia! Virginia. (laughs) (laughs) And she's like really confident at nailing it. And it's just, she's a trier. And her whole, like her whole plot motivation is, as I said, to get out of the town. But it's because she wants to model herself on Diane Sawyer, the like, you know, who's like a news broadcaster in the US with great with name enough rec- with enough name recognition that I do know who she is even though I, yeah. I if you like if you sh- if you showed me a lineup of potential Diane Sawyers I don't think I could pick her out yeah no but I, I've certainly heard her name mm. right so and she was a beauty queen I think in her own yeah uh, she was yeah, yeah teens or whatever young womanhood and um, so she's she's you know Amber is her whole goal is to get out of to get out of the trailer park and onto screens as a TV anchor. And ultimately, because of niceness and good luck, that is what happens to her uh, while, while the rest of them end up dead, right? But, but um, all in, I, you know, I think it is like a, a perfectly, uh, it, just a perfect encapsulation of the American dream. You have uh, someone in the trailer park who wants a way out. It's not even that she particularly wants to win the you know the the competition it's that the competition is her exit route yeah and that's why she wants to stay in it even when you know she just about wants wants to stay in it as the body count starts to rise and it's very obvious what's go- well not obvious but it's sort of not not obvious what's going on mm. right and uh, Kirsten Dunst is fantastic like she's like I, I honestly think this is like one of her best performances because she's so nice and wholesome and sells that niceness which is really really hard as I said before it's definitely Denise Richards best performance I would argue it's Kirsty Alley's best performance Alison Janney walks away with every scene she's in because she's really definitely really one of her, I'd argue that it's one of her best and right. she's won Oscars you know what I mean and like it's Emmys, in the top five at right. least uh, Brittany Murphy great in it in this relatively small role mm. right as like a, a 
a, a competitor, a, a competitor who <laughs> did you hear that one? She just makes this little joke about how that her parents only had her so her brother could have a kidney, right? <laughs> and like, I think I missed her that. brother is like the beloved child of the family, and she isn't. Uh, she's brilliant in it. Amy Adams, br- like, there's a scene uh, where Amy Adams is, is. It's right. It's the night of the pageant, and they've obviously said to her, "Are you nervous?" And she's like, "I am." Yeah, it's been about two months. I haven't told my boyfriend yet. <laughs> and they're like, about the pageant? <laughs> and she's like, oh yeah. <laughs> right? Like, it just, like, I don't think, you know, look, yeah, I've said, uh, you know, I don't want to just rehash things what, that I said before and comment on my own genius, right? But like, basically, um, the whole thing is, it's such a, like, while there are these grotesque moments in it yeah. that are appalling and bad and, I like, I'm not giving it a free pass on some of the some of the jokes. Like, the eating disorder one is especially bad, right? Yeah. Um, w- the rest of it, I think, is surprisingly wholesome, mm. right? Like, I think it's very celebratory of the trailer park community because when uh, they're, when they're, you know, when their mobile home explodes in an arson attack, essentially, right, designed to kill her, mm. uh, like, the community does rally around them in the sense that Loretta takes her in and, uh, like, her mother, <laughs> her mother gets a hook instead of, you know, to replace her hand her that friend. is fused with a can. And then there's this really cute scene where she's trying to open a can of beer later on, right? And she can't get it open. And Loretta's like, just use your other hand. She's like, the doctor said I had to practice. And then she just basically gets so frustrated that she just pierces a hole in the can with the hook and then pours a tiny amount into a glass. And then she's like, I did it. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like it's, it, even though it, uh, it is, it, it, it finds comedy in these, in these uh, stereotypical characters, but I think it, it is very warm towards them, right? Like it is very obvious that the Le- the Lehmans are not a nice family, even though they're the rich family. Yeah. Uh, the rest of them, you know, the the you know the Atkins, they're that, that family. They're all treated with respect, I think, by the script and by the direction. Uh, I think it feels like a really lived in town. Yeah. For that, and and it and it like. It's, I think you don't need a lot of exposition. It's already like, okay, like like I love Amber. I'm You, you root for her. You're yes. kind of rooting for most of the rest of them as well at the same time. Yes. And then you hate the Lehmans. Like, yes. Yeah. And and it sells that really, really, really well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alison Janey said this is the, like, that people are fanatical about this and it's one of the ones she's approached about the most. Like, she overheard people talking about her in an airport and she dropped in and she was like, yeah, that was me. And then they just started screaming. <laughs> and then also Amber's mom, uh, they had wanted Goldie Hawn for that right. role. Oh, which maybe. I could also see. Yeah. I can see that more than Scorny Weaver, to be honest. But yeah, agreed. That's just me. And as you said, we need to judge it on the performance that we got. Yes. Um, is this the best pageant movie? And if not, what is? So uh, in my uh, little bit of research that I did about this, um, a lot of the reviews of it that reviewed it so unfavorably compared it to this movie, I think it's called Smile or Smiley or something. From, Smile, and, yeah, and there was another one that I'd seen that's escaping me now. From 1975, yeah. which is a comedy, a, a comedy about a beauty pageant as well. And I was like, I've never seen this movie. And if I had really done my homework, I would have watched it before coming on this. Oh, babe, right? I didn't watch it either. So I read... <laughs> What I did do was read the Wikipedia summary, right? Incredible. And a more confusing movie summary I have never, I have yet to encounter. Okay. Because it is like five paragraphs long and I honestly think each one was like a separate film, (laughs) practically, (laughs) right? So I can't compare it to that. Uh, Off the top of my head, I can't really think of other beauty pageant shows. I guess it's a little bit like... Um, I can't remember what it's called, but you know, there's that movie, uh, that movie with your one, you know that one, right? Are you thinking of Miss Congeniality? No. Oh, well, I should have been thinking of Miss Congeniality. Obviously, that's the obvious comparison. I'm an idiot. But no, that's not what I was thinking of. I was thinking of, um, what's your Harry? one? Harry? No, what's your one in... That's not pageant either, that's prom. What's fucking your one? It, it's like a, it's a comedy about a kind of like X Factor style singing show with, um, is, what's her name? This Is Us. You know, this is... A, Lorelai is that, Gilmore. No. Uh, <laughs> you know, what's that, is, what's that show where they split the family, like, in, in the time... This is terrible. I'm sorry. No, I, it's, it's fine. Adam's Googling it. It's fine. He'll, we'll get um, there in the end. With... Uh, Randy Quaid is in it. He plays the American president. I can in see. It. Oh, it's I can, American uh, Dreams. Randy, hang on. I think I think you're right. American Dreams but, movie. Thank you. 
Uh, is it with a Z? Yes. Yes. Okay, because I'm looking at American Dreams. That's not it. 2006? Yeah. No, hang on. Yeah, sorry. And is and Mandy Moore. Mandy Moore. Is and Hugh Grant. Right. Yeah. yeah, yes. A widely popular television singing contest captures yes. the country's attention and as the competition looks to be between a young Midwestern gal and a show tunes loving young man. This would probably qualify for a flop if anyone wants to do it. <laughs> yeah, it had a budget of $17 million and it made 16.5. Perfect. So I close. saw that one in the cinema. Did anyway, you? Right. But like that's a kind of, like so that's a, that's a reality-based competition movie yeah. in which it's all about, uh, you know, the characters are, are all all in on it, it like the it, like the Mandy Moore character is 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 like a Becky Lehman style you know conniving skeeving grafter who wants to win at any cost mm. so that is what uh, it reminds me of that movie that no one's seen right <laughs> conveniently right <laughs> uh, obviously Miss Congeniality is an obvious comparison so good I've yeah. watched that May just that's some due rewatch I'm sure, yeah that is due rewatch Miss Congeniality too probably a bit of a flop if anyone also wants yeah, to do that I have never seen it I saw it years, it, like I couldn't tell you what happens. And I just remember that it's bad. Yeah, well, I mean, it also, I know it stars Regina King as well as uh, Sandra Bullock. Yeah. And they both went on to win Oscars, so. So maybe the thing is to be in a movie about pageants. Kirsten Dunst f- hasn't won an Oscar yet, has she? Uh, she's she was not nominated. Gone it <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, she uh, like be in a flop, be in a flop about a pageant, and that and but be good in it, and that's the key to Hollywood success. I think that is uh, the, like essentially the tagline of this podcast now, because a lot of the ones that we've covered, they've been floppy and then they go on to success. Colin Farrell. But also probably not going to win. Actually, maybe we shouldn't say that because I don't know when this is going out. And he might, but he won't. I don't think he will. And like now, because the, the SAG Awards just happened in our timeline. Uh, and basically, uh, they have thrown everything. Because I honestly was, I'm like... I thought it was going to be Austin Butler again because I of, was convinced Kate Blanchett was going to win, right? The Oscar over Michelle Yeoh. But now Michelle Yeoh won the SAG. And a lot, you know, so that's actually... The SAG actually, is the better is, indicator, yes, yeah. right? Um, and then... I, I secretly think Paul Meskel is going to win. You're the second person to say that. I had someone else in recording and they said, was it Robin that said that or was it someone else? Yeah. Robin that, was like, I think they're going to do... My she reasoning... Be, she had a comparison, but she was like, I think it's going to be Paul Meskel. My reasoning is that the votes for Colin Farrell are locked. The votes for Austin Butler are locked. The votes for Brendan Fraser are locked. The spare votes aren't, right? So like maybe Paul Meskel will emerge as the front runner from just the what's left, right? That's that's my logic. If I was putting money on it, I would bet on him. But I don't think he'll give a very good speech, sorry. No, he won't. <laughs> Whereas Colin Farrell will yeah. and I'm so annoyed and he's probably not going to be in anything else again that'll win an Oscar. Anyway, that's another conversation for another day. Um, and and um, I feel also very sorry for Kerry Condon because like, I think Angela Bassett is going to do the thing. Yeah. Right? She is. And it's like, that's a total, like, she's winning an Oscar for a trailer. Like, basically for... Yeah, she's barely, I haven't seen Black Panther right? kind of like, her, but she's barely in it. Is she not? No, she, I mean, she's in it, oh. right? But like... Oh, okay. So I had heard she's, she's in it for like three scenes. I was like, She's winning generous. an overdue Oscar. Okay. Which is the least satisfying Oscar. Yeah. Wait, and like, I'm, I'm all for Kerry, right? Go, like, bring it home, love, but it's not happening. <laughs> Oh my God. We'll see. We'll see. James, it has been a pleasure. Thank you. Where can people hear more of your musings should Um, they want to? Well, you can hear me on The Moncrief Show on a Monday at three o'clock or on its podcasts uh, on TV on the radio. And uh, if you are aged between 11 uh, or 12 and 18 and you live in North Dublin, chances are I might teach you a foreign (laughs) language. (laughs) Obsessed. James, <laughs> it has been such a pleasure to have you on Flop Culture. Thanks Thank so much. Thanks, Mel. Thank you to James again for joining me. You can hear James every week on the Moncrief Show, on News Talk, reviewing TV shows. He's very witty. I cannot wait to have him back. Had a great chat. Finally, top of the flops. Who is it? You're a flop. Flop, flop, flop. You know what? Kind of hard to pick this week because there was a couple of stories that I'm a bit old to, like the Simuliu replying to TikTokers, like that's kind of flop behavior. Don't do that. Don't engage with people who don't like you online and are criticizing you because it's just a black hole, but he's doing it anyway. Um, I was going to pick that, but you know what? 
I mean, it's hard not to have like ITV this morning, Holly Willoughby, Philip Schofield, all in this flop category for this kind of massively flop behaviour. I think it's really insulting as two TV presenters to insult viewers in the way that they have by kind of pretending that nothing has been happening between them. Like they do a newspaper segment as part of the show and obviously the newspapers have been covering this story breathlessly. Should they be? That's another debate for another day. But it's just a bit mad that they've just actively chosen to ignore it. And I get that maybe there's something to do with like due process, due diligence, all that jazz. But something just isn't sitting right with me and it feels mega fake to see them like air kissing each other and waving each other goodbye as Holly goes off and does something with the prince's trust. I don't know. It's just flat behaviour. Like someone someone needs to leave the digging in the heels and just hoping for the best while you kind of sink the show into the sea I don't know flop behavior if you ask me but if you have a better suggestion for who was top of the flops this week let me know if you're listening on Spotify there's actually a question box that you can answer in the episode so do answer there I'd love to hear from you or otherwise you can get in touch at flop culture underscore pod on social media open to hearing from you on the email as well hello flop culture at gmail.com excited to hear from you but until then thank you so much for listening please rate the show five stars on apple Podcasts. if you do i'll recommend a bop or a flop to you personalized you love it all you have to do is leave your nickname in the review i got a lovely review last week from rye reed fab podcast insightful great guests the most random pieces of pop culture history please someone do the saturdays Right, your wish is my command. I'm always open to a conversation that revolves around the Saturdays. Though I would argue they're kind of not really flops. Though I would say, is it floppy that they only got one number one in the UK? Yes. But that's not their fault. It's the public's fault. We cannot trust the greater public. But I will be putting out some asks and luring some guests into covering them for season three. So watch the space for that. Thank you for listening. Uh, in the meantime, my bop for you is the Laura and Vula album, Pink Noise. Came out during the pandemic. Kind of pass people by a little, I feel, but it's gorgeous. And I think you'll enjoy it if you love your pop music, which I'm assuming you do. I hope that's not an unfair assumption. You can also leave a five-star review on Spotify. Thank you all for the new reviews. Makes me very, very happy and helps new people find the show, which is great. This podcast, as always, has been edited by Adam Shanahan. Last episode of season two next week. You're not going to want to miss it. It's very, very funny. So until then, bye-bye. Bye-bye.